I hope you've enjoyed the uh, After Hours um, Leonardo, A Life in Drawing exhibition uh, next door. My name is Caroline Wilkinson. I'm the director of the School of Art and Design at Liverpool John Moores University. And this is a, a laser organised event um, through the School of Art and also the MA Art in Science programme. So uh, Liverpool Laser is part of um, a global network of art science groups. It's called Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, which isn't at all awkward. Um, and they're sponsored by Leonardo, the International Society of Art Sciences and Technology based in the US. Uh, there are only 36 laser hosts around the world and only two in the UK and Liverpool is one of them. Um, and we hope to bring together people from both art and science backgrounds to talk about subjects that are relevant to both. Um, and um, this evening's talk is titled uh, Leonardo's Laboratory and it follows a daytime event today that was run um, looking at um, 3D technology and what Leonardo might have used had he been alive today with some of his inventions and work. Uh, but I'm sure that you'll hear more about that as well. Um, this evening we've got a number of people who are going to talk about um, Leonardo and his legacy. Um, we've got Walker Art Gallery's in-house curator uh, of the exhibition. We've got a 3D medical artist and we've got a digital 3D maker um, from uh, the School of Art and Design. So I'll just introduce them to you first. So first of all we've got Xanthi Brooks who is the National Mu Museum of Liverpool's Senior Curator of Continental European Fine Art. Uh, and she's, um, as you've heard, the curator of the current exhibition. And her research and interests cover continental Europe ranging from 800 years to uh, the 20th century. Is that yes, accurate? That's, that, that's the collections I... Ah, uh, OK. Yes. Excellent. The National Museum of Liverpool, yeah. Uh, we also have Mark Ruffley, who's a lecturer in 3D digital art um, at the School of Art and Design and also the programme leader for the MA Art in Science. Uh, Mark trained as a medical artist and specialises in visualising anatomy and medical science through 3D data acquisition and 3D modelling. And we have Lowell Baker, last but not least on the end, who's the manager of Fab Lab, uh, Fab Lab Liverpool at the School of Art and Design, based in uh, what we call the X Gallery. And that has our cutting edge um, 3D printing, 3D technology and um, fabrication software and technology. You're all welcome to visit and view the Fab Lab um, should you want to in the art school. Yes, so we have our on our next Fab Social. Actually. Okay. Yeah. So we're planning on having a conversation today for about 45 minutes and there'll be time for questions. Uh, we are recording um, because part of the the laser hosting um, criteria is that we record and then place that on the um, international website so that other people around the world can access the event that we've had this evening. Um, so let's start off with um, some questions uh, to our guests. Uh, I'll start with Xanthi, if that's all right, uh, to ask you to introduce the exhibition and briefly talk about Leonardo's academic training. Okay. Well, um, the exhibition that you've just had an opportunity to look round um, uh, is um, drawn from the Royal Collections um, collections, and it, what you've been looking at are sheets from Leonardo's notebooks um, that he kept throughout his life. They were his private papers, his working papers, that he continually amended, he continually added to, from uh, the day he first started sketching in the um, 1470s, 1480s, right through to his death in 1519. And uh, those uh, notebooks, or one, um, uh, about 600 drawings from his notebooks, were um, mounted in uh, one album um, by a, a later <coughs> artist, and they, uh, that album eventually made it to the Royal Collection in um, about 1670, in other words, in Charles II's period. And it's been uh, remained in the Royal Collection since then. And um, the exhibition is showing um, 12 drawings um, 
uh, here in Liverpool, and there are 12 other drawings in 12 other, um, uh, 11 other venues uh, across the country, all being shown simultaneously uh, until uh, May Bank Holiday, uh, the 6th of May. So that's what the exhibition consists of. Um, the short answer to um, Le Leonardo's academic career is that he didn't have one. Um, he didn't have an academic career, and I should explain that the main reason for that um, was that he was illegitimate. Now, that may sound an odd reason for not having uh, an academic career, but if he had been a legitimate son of his father, his father was a uh, legal notary um, who drew up contracts and wills and became, in fact, quite an important legal notary in Florence. Um, if uh, Leonardo had been a legitimate son of, uh, of his father, um, he would have, um, first of all, been sent as a schoolboy to Latin school, and he would have learned Latin, which he wasn't sent to school to learn Latin. Um, and then thereafter, he would have been able to either um, go to university and further his academic career that way, or <coughs> he would have followed in his father's footsteps and become uh, a notary, and he would have had to join the Notaries Guild. The Notaries Guild in Florence, um, being partly um, a legal um, guild, did not look kindly on illegitimate um, members, and in fact it excluded anybody who had the taint of legitimacy. So Leonardo was not able to follow in his father's footsteps. Instead, he spent his um, early uh, career um, essentially observing and, re and recording and drawing um, the landscape and the, uh, just the activities uh, around him, because he started off, he was originally brought up in the uh, village town of Vinci, um, his, um, his uh, surname, um, before he moved to Florence and, in fact, uh, entered a, uh, painted, uh, a painting studio, in fact, under uh, an artist um, called Andrea del Verrocchio, who was primarily um, a, a sculptor uh, by training. So, uh, uh, so Leonardo never had an academic background and he prided himself he would he actually said he called himself um, the pupil of experience that's what he um, claimed to be and he in fact uh, on one occasion said um, I have no special talents I'm just passionately curious about the world so that's um, you know, that gives you an idea of Leonardo's background now I said that he never went to Latin school he never learned Latin but uh, further on in his career, when he started, for example, um, putting together uh, an anatomy treaties and doing scientific experiments, effectively, he realised that all other treatises are actually, were actually written in Latin. Um, so he did have to self-teach himself, and they are, there, is, there are sort of no notebook pages which literally are full of um, Latin verbs and grammar that he was obviously teaching himself. Uh, but otherwise, all the notes that you see on all the drawings, they're all by Leonardo, apart from the numbers, but the notes are by Leonardo, and they're all in um, Italian, as well as being in mirror writing. Great, thank you. We're all very relieved that he didn't train to be well, a notary. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he was <laughs> relieved he didn't train to be a notary. So the next question is for Mark. Um, as a medical artist, um, I'm assuming that Leonardo was influential and inspirational to you, but why do you think that his anatomical studies have, have still have such celebrity to them? I think, for me, I studied illustration for my first degree, and I was always very curious about anatomy and, and botany. So, of course, I was very inspired by his works, but I was handed my first year at university, a postcard from my parents, which I brought with me, and it's simply just a postcard from the Royal Fetch Trust of one of the artworks that's on display in Manchester Art Gallery at the moment, and it's the major organs and vessels. And I've had this with me ever since, and it's travelled with me everywhere, and it's been sat on my desk, by numerous desks, for the past eight years in different institutions, 
So yeah, huge inspiration for me. Um, I think the reason he's stayed kind of so prominently in our eye in terms of his anatomical drawing specifically is the fact that he was able to visualise things that we might only now see or think we can do in a possible sense through technology. So seeing inside the body and seeing the body from multiple viewpoints at different times. So what I really appreciate with a lot of his sheets and the one outside you've seen in the corner for example is it's one viewpoint of the, the shoulder, of the back, but it's peeled away layer by layer, which became a common practice in anatomical visualization. Um, but at that time, that kind of almost exploding view, that pulling away of things, wasn't really um, in vogue. It was very kind of up to him, as I said, through his curiosity, to peel away those layers. And you know, using the technology of his time, which were his crayons and his chalks, um, and his eyes, Leonardo's eye, to visualise these things really, you wouldn't mind that, right? I think the technical aspects of his drawings and illustrations, especially with noting anatomical form, are second to none, really. And I saw an exhibition at Holyrood Palace many years ago in which um, there was a, a company called Primal Pictures based in London who were tasked to produce um, anatomical visualizations, 3D visualizations from CT, MRI, clinical data sets, and compare them with these illustrations as direct comparisons. And the accuracy is outstanding. What was, what was that company called again? Primal Pictures. Oh. <laughs> and they, they make educational anatomical resources um, and so on. So that brings me on nicely to the question for Lol, which is um, because he was at of his time, very cutting edge in the way he looked at things and the way the technology of his time that he used. Yeah. Um, what sort of technology do you think he would be using now if it was modern accessibility? I was going to answer that, Caroline, but I'm going to kind of reverse that. Because looking at the, the workshop today and actually working with the, the young people, it's about why the, the Fab Lab was created in the first place. A lot of the early talk was about Renaissance. And actually, Renaissance men, which I've sort of referenced more as the age of Renaissance and creating a space where people of interest in lots of stuff can come. And our, our sort of kind of philosophy was about making almost anything, which would have... And, I, and I'm kind of thinking, why would Leonardo come to a fab lab in the first place? And I think he'd come to the fab lab because we've got the tools and technologies to create almost anything. So, how, we, how would you use that technology? Well, you told me before, and we were talking about, we just basically mocked up one of his inventions, the tank, um, and it was done in the, in, the, in the source of Fab Lab, where we just used some digital software and our laser cutters. But what we found out was it, that it actually doesn't work. And that's what I really love about Leonardo, is that he actually, failure wasn't really a problem. We all learn from the mistakes that we make. And I think for, for Leonardo to come into the Fab Lab and actually, and I'll just pass this around so you can give it a little weird. And you can actually see that the wheels go in the opposite direction to which they should. So, and, and again, uh, coming into the lab, you would, you would sort of, in our lab, you would, you would access some new tools. So the tools like virtual reality and augmented realities is how we would use them. And today with the, with the children, it was brilliant, wasn't it? It was, yeah. The, and we say that we take data and turn it into things and then turn things into data. So Leonardo would be, like the horse was a classic, wasn't it, today? The horse was a classic where you know, would, would scan and capture that image as digital information. We'd, we'd then sort of uh, transform that and then we'd be able to make it physical and then put it into a virtual world. So I, for me, Leonardo would just be about a place as a polymath where he could express and be creative. I think fundamentally, and I always think that creators will, will rule the world one day, is that it, it was just a place for, me, for Leonardo to be creative. And I think that's what, how he, he would see it. And I would love the fact that he would come to the Fab Lab and actually make almost anything. And, and Santi, do you know how, how hands-on was Leonardo in oh, his... Oh, very hands-on, yes, in all sorts of ways. Um, I mean, the anatomy um, uh, sort of um, 
treaties and the anatomy drawings he did, he, you know, he took part in at least 20, if not more, dissections and autopsies, you know, so he actually took part in them. That was unusual mm-hmm. for artists at that yes. time to have access to cadavers. Yes, yes. Um, you know, and I think he would have he would have loved the Fab Lab because, as he says, I'm a, you know he was just a passionate, passionate, curious, and uh, about er- about everything. And I think to be able to satisfy his curiosity by by experimenting, you know, I think I'm interested about sorts of people as well, people like experiments. Did he have a, a, a large team of people he worked with? Did he work with lots of he, collaborations? He he, um, he had quite a lot of students and pupils, yeah. um, but I get the impression that they were um, there as pupils of his, as painters, yeah. rather than, um, than designers um, yeah. um, or, or makers of um, engines or, or whatever. Um, uh, but he did collaborate at different stages. I mean, the, the anatomy drawings are a case in point where yeah. he collaborated with a doctor um, when uh, on another occasion he collaborated um, with another, um, uh, another architect painter called Francesca Di Giorgio and they went off to, um, to um, discuss you know, designing um, some sort of a, a Pavia cathedral or whatever. Yeah. So he did collaborate um, and I think that's what he, he liked being um, surrounded uh, by lots of people who had different views yeah. to him and, and, and whom he could actually discuss things with. Yes, he was the eternal student. He was always working he, to learn and experiment. Y- yes, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So after his death, his, his work was separated into volumes of art studies and science studies. I just wonder if you could explain why that happened and what your thoughts are on that separation. Yeah. I mean, if you, anybody who looks at the drawings um, in the exhibition you can see that for Leonardo, there was no split between arts and sciences. I, you only have to look at the, the, one of the double-sided drawings, in fact, either of the double-sided drawings, but one of them where on one side he's doing lots and lots of different studies of horses rearing and bucking and, um, and baring their teeth and showing um, sort of fear and aggression and comparing those horses' heads with um, uh, a, a soldier's and a, a, a man's head and then interposing a, a lion as well so he's doing all that and that comes from a notebook which is full of studies of horses and then you look at the other side of that drawing and he, yes he starts off by tracing through from the front to the back he traces through one of the horse's heads uh, in chalk in black chalk and then he switches the, um, the whole sheet of paper over through 90 degrees does another horse's head, but in pen and ink this time, it was smaller, and then all of a sudden the rest of the, the sheet is entirely about um, uh, doing diagrams of the phases of the moon, um, and the note that is beside, written beside the horse's head is not to do with the horse's head, it's to do with why he thinks uh, the moon appears larger on the horizon than when it's further up in, in the sky, and you know, putting together a, a sort of idea for that. So for Leonardo, there was no, oh, you know, I'm doing horses and this is for a painting. It was for a huge um, 70-foot mural that he'd been commissioned to do. Um, And um, yet, you know, whilst sketching a horse's head, he suddenly decides that he's actually going to spend the rest of the sheet of paper about, you know, the phases of the moon. My mind does that all the time. I flip all over the place. <laughs> you know, and, and so, so for Leonardo, there was just no split. And there's several other occasions in the, uh, in the exhibition where, he, where, where the drawings are one thing and that the notes are about something completely, to our mind, a, you know, a scientific topic rather than a, an artistic topic. Um, but what happened was that he kept all his papers, you know, right until his death, and then he bequeathed them um, to his favourite um, favorite pupil who um, was uh, an adopted heir um, called Francesco Melzi. Now, Francesco Melzi was a painter, 
Um, and he took um, Leonardo's notebooks, and the first thing he did was he rearranged them into uh, five separate series um, and started this sort of splitting into arts and, and into uh, science subjects. And then he also numbered all of these sheets. So all the numbers that you sometimes see uh, on the drawings, those are put there by Francesco Melzi after uh, Leonardo's death. And then when Melzi died in the um, 15, uh, late 1560s, um, they, these drawings are acquired by another artist, this time a sculptor called Pompeo Leone. And Pompeo Leone then did even further um, reordering and he mounted them in at least two albums, if not more albums, and separated them even further into artistic and scientific. So that, for example, one album that was mainly um, uh, engineering drawings um, now, and, uh, now resides and has resided since um, the uh, uh, 17th century um, in the uh, Biblioteca Ambrosiana in Milan. Um, so that um, album is there. Then there's this um, album that ended up with the World Collection, um, which again is predominantly, has a lot, a lot of um, horse drawings as, as it happens, um, but they're predominantly art ones, although there are some that are scientific uh, um, uh, drawings as well. So essentially that's where the split comes mm. in, it's because the people who inherited these drawings were, both of them were artists, mm. and they, so they were seeing these drawings through the prism of what artists want from these great Leonardo's notebooks. You know, okay. they're, they're interested in. So it was, it was those artists trying to order a disordered mind, rather than it being a change in cultural view of, of art science, or um, both? Um, yes, I mean, I think he, even within his lifetime, Leonardo was seen as... Uh, unusual in his um, uh, polymath. I mean, mm. there were other there were other artists who were both painters, architects, um, and sculptors, mm. um, but um, they didn't also tend to do engineering and uh, sort of hydraulic throws and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Leonardo was considered. Um, uh, unusual in that respect. Okay. I guess a lot of his contemporaries in terms of his anatomical studies, like Andreas Vesalius, mm -hmm. who was an anatomist, but was often credited as the artist, annoyingly, um, <laughs> worked with an artist or a number of artists to do his illustrations. So Vesalius would do the dissections and pupils of other artists, like Titian, would produce the illustrations. Whereas Da Vinci, I guess, was unique in that sense. Yes, he, in he the... did do that dual role. Yes, yeah. I think, unfortunately for us, nowadays, education, mm. that societal art, science, kind of established thinking has not held us back, but it's kind of stifled some sort of creativity, in my opinion. But we are now moving back towards a more cohesive STEAM agenda. Yeah. So STEM subjects being science, technology, engineering and maths, STEAM being the, the re-addition of arts back into that in an educational framework. And that's what we try to do with the Art and Science Master's Programme at the School of Art and Design, is, is to enable collaborations between artists and scientists that now are maybe not possible mm. because of those societal kind of divisions, um, to take out the best parts of practice and research and combine them together that might produce impact on a bigger societal change scale, sorry, but maybe would have never have happened if it was just a scientist. The artist left in a room separately. Yeah. Lol, you got anything to add on that? Well, only that it's about also, I think, that I'm thinking about Leonardo and how we're the sort of fade in a world that's globally connected using the internet. And maybe that's broken down some of those divides we talk about before, and how we now have an interest in lots of things or access to lots of information and knowledge. So that's something that. I, so as a kind of, I'm looking through the space of a fab lab and how it enables people to be connected. And I love the idea of the, of the STEAM approach. Um, 
personally, I think the arts are at the centre of that, of that universe, and that, that creativity then connects out into, into the sciences and the engineering and the mathematics. And that's kind of the, the approach that will go forward. So I think definitely with the, and again, it's, I'd just love to see Leonardo on the internet <laughs> surfing and finding out about all this other stuff that's going around. I think what I really liked about what Zalanti was saying earlier about him not learning Latin, but he wrote in Italian and then eventually learned Latin later on to fit himself within that scientific field. Mm. And we try and, again with our students and our research, try and merge those two cultures together and we challenge our students to try and develop a shared language to do that. That's really inherently difficult now. You know, if I say experimentation or experiment from a, a, an artist's perspective, an expert from a scientific perspective, they're often deemed as totally different things. Yeah. But can we share certain aspects of that language? I think we can. So I, you agree. <laughs> I wanted to ask as well why you thought um, his anatomical drawings primarily is what I'm asking about. Why they've been so, um, why they've become so important because there's been a huge number of incredible anatomy drawings over the years and from an anatomical point of view a lot of what Leonardo drew was incorrect we now know from an anatomical perspective so why are they still so persistently loved as anatomical drawings? I think they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because we haven't moved enough. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with, uh, with Mark. I mean, it, I mean, partly they are aesthetically beautiful um, as well as being precise. That, yes, they are areas which he got totally wrong, but I should explain that um, as well as uh, being difficult to access um, dead bodies, um, uh, he, the dead bodies that um, were available for autopsies um, were those which um, were um, orphaned in, in the sense that um, they didn't have any family to claim them and therefore bury them. So they tended to be, uh, they tended predominantly to be male hmm. for a start um, and either very, very old um, or uh, young babies. Um, or they were criminals um, because they were... So from the gallows directly. Yes, uh, effectively. Because the um, problem that occurred uh, with regard to autopsies and dissections is that the church authorities um, didn't approve of dissection of bodies um, that had cells, effectively. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and a family would want to bury their uh, loved one. Um, they wouldn't want their loved one to be um, cut up. So when, um, uh, when Leonardo started um, working on his anatomy treaties, which was, although he'd first done a, 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 an autopsy way back in 1507, he really started doing a lot of autopsies in 1510, 1511, um, when he was in uh, Milan and he collaborated, he teamed up with a doctor called Marcantonio de la Torre, a young um, doctor, uh, medic, who was a professor of medicine, um, lecturer in medicine at uh, the nearby University of Pavia. And because it was a university, the university was allowed to have access to um, dead bodies, um, and so um, he teamed up with Mar uh, Marc Antonio um, and did uh, at least 20 um, autopsies uh, with him um, over this sort of winter period, 1510, 1511. Um, but he only did one fetal, yes, um, in utero um, dissection. That's right. And that's where the most inaccuracy lies, isn't it? It's female. Yes, because he. Womb. Um, and, and it was believed at the time that, I gather, that it was believed that mammalian reproduction was the same across all mammals. So, so because 
uh, Leonardo didn't have access to uh, a female body. He therefore um, dissected a pig and um, their other mammals mm. and then took what he found in a pig, uh, pig's reproductive organs, and assumed that that would be yeah. appropriate for uh, in a woman, yes. And his most famous drawing of a, of a baby in utero um, is actually it's a cow's utero, mm. because that was what he had access to at the time. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I think, like, for himself, drawing as a technology, that, that was his tool, that was his technology, that was his X-ray, his CT scanner. His aim, I guess, was to try and, through experimentation, avoid visual doubt. And it's quite interesting that he was trying to work without um, being biased to certain perspectives, but he could still only work with what he had in front of him at the same time. So that leads me nicely on to the next question. Um, Xanthi, which is maybe if you could just explain what you know about his workflow in terms of using drawing as his laboratory, if you like, and his way of, of producing knowledge. Yes. Um, well, he, um, he had various um, methods. Um, the, the, the horse notebook that I mentioned earlier on, that was essentially a, a notebook for research notes into horses' behaviour and, um, uh, and uh, the way they moved um, uh, and also making this sort of comparison with uh, humans um, and, and other animals. Um, and he couldn't help, he, his curiosity would spur him on he couldn't help, so he, even though he was doing this, um, these sketches for a mural which was about an equestrian battle scene which um, took, part in, took place in the 14th century, um, he couldn't, uh, where you know, horses and soldiers and male figures, uh, of course, um, were part of the, uh, that, the central scene, but he couldn't help then doing a comparative drawing of a lion's head despite the fact that in the, in the battle scene there were no ever going to be any lions, but he, you know, he just, his curiosity sort of spurred him on. So he would do these sort of um, lots and lots of um, drawings and he, um, he, he moved through different drawing techniques. Uh, when he was uh, younger, um, right until the end of the 1490s, he used... Um, uh, particularly metal point um, technique, which you could see in what's called the, the sports a horse um, drawing, um, where you actually draw um, with a, a metal rod, usually a, a silver rod, on a, a pigmented surface, which is sl slightly roughened. Um, and as you draw, as you draw, you literally leave fragments of the silver and that's what produces these really lovely um, silvery, grey, um, grey hatched um, lines. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very linear form of drawing. And also, it's incredibly dif difficult because it's a combination of, of leaving uh, this metal on a pigmented surface. Um, it's very difficult to amend. Right. So you have to be very controlled and once you've done it, it's incredibly difficult to amend or change. Um, so, although he produced lots of drawings which are um, spectacularly precise um, and linear, he, um, by the end of the 1490s, he actually had moved on to using, instead of metal point, he used um, uh, black and red chalks in particular, and, and white chalk as, uh, as a highlighter, and that, uh, enabled him to produce the, uh, similarly precise drawings in, for example, his botanical um, treaties, uh, or for his botanical treaties, um, similarly precise, but much more subtle and tonal and shaded um, drawings. Um, and so he effectively moved on from one technology to another because the other technology enabled him to do more. So that horse was part of a project today? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to explain that? Yeah, so because the, the sports a horse, as it's commonly known, was 
never fully realised. We proposed in our pop-up fab lab today that we would try and realise it. So we made the horse using our digital tech of 3D modelling. And, okay, we don't have a seven foot high 3D printer. <laughs> so we printed a very small scale 3D model, which unfortunately didn't finish in time for tonight, otherwise we would have passed it round um, to show you. Um, but that, that piece in particular is very, I know you told me that in one of his letters, it yeah. was, don't talk about the horse. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah I, need, I, need to, I need to explain what happened about, yeah, definitely, about the horse. <laughs> Um, he was given this commission um, originally in the mid 1480s uh, when he moved to Milan um, and was uh, commissioned uh, um, to produce an equestrian monument um, to honour the former military commander and uh, controller of Milan um, called uh, Francesco uh, Sforza. Um, and um, it was going to be a huge um, bronze monument. Um, you know, 23 foot high, seven meters high. Um, and he starts off um, in the 1480s when he's first given uh, this commission. And at this point, uh, he probably had never actually um, created a sculpture before. Um, Which really surprised me when you told me that. Yes. <laughs> I assume um, yeah, he did he's <laughs> very, very, although he had come from a sculptor's uh, studio, so he did have a sort of background in. Uh, you know, he knew what to do, but he had probably never um, actually created the sculpture, and certainly not one that was uh, going to be seven metres um, high. And he starts off doing drawings with the idea that he was going to have a rearing horse, so back on its hind legs, rearing up over a fallen warrior. Um, and he starts doing quite a lot of series of those drawings, and then must have realised... Um, that that was going to be a terribly unstable um, sculpture to actually produce. Um, so he switches to what the, the horse that you see, see in our exhibition. This one behind me, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is um, a much more stable um, uh, structure, um, a sort of um, a walking um, horse with a front leg uh, raised and uh, rear uh, Leg, one of the rear legs also um, going forward. Um, uh, and he does phenomenal, lo lots of drawings like this on blue um, pigmented uh, paper in metal point. He does lots of measured drawings of horses. And we know the horses that he, 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 um, he drew and measured. The, you know, they were the um, commander of the uh, cavalry uh, in, in Milan. He used his horse as a... Um, uh, to actually do these drawings, um, and then he starts, um, you know, getting together the amount of bronze that he will need to create this um, horse. And he, um, you know, there are uh, plans of the um, forges, uh, moulds, and uh, whatever that would be needed to produce um, this horse. And he get, gathers together this um, bronze, and he's, by, by now it's um, in the 1490s. So he's been doing this for several years already. Um, and then in 1494, um, the French invade Italy. Uh, and Milan is relatively close to um, the French-Italian uh, border. And so all the bronze, something like 74 tonnes of it or whatever, is all requisitioned and goes off to um, make um, cannon and cannonballs. So he loses all the bronze that he's had to create. And, OK, that's a, a sort of a, a setback, but he still has the um, same size clay model that he made in order to, um, to actually um, cast the uh, bronze because it, the, the sculpture would have been done, used, done using a, what's called a lost wax process where you need a... Uh, a model in clay um, around which you um, cast the um, molten metal. So he still has that, right? Um, uh, and then, uh, five years later, 1499, the French actually um, take over Milan. <laughs> um, and although uh, 
in, in the immediate um, period, Leonardo stays in, in Milan, but uh, the French troops then use this life-size or giant-size uh, clay model as for artillery practice and totally destroy the model. So he's not only lost the bronze, which after all he might have thought, well, in peacetime I will be able to do it all over again, but he's lost the model as well. And so later on there is this sort of really rather sad um, sentence, couple of sentences in the letter that he writes to Ludovico Sforza, who was the man who commissioned it, um, saying something like, don't mention the horse. Um, you know, and, then, and then even saying um, something along the lines about um, not being paid for two years of his, <laughs> of his time working on it. Um, so, you know, it became a, yeah. And you can see why we then chose that as the object of inquiry today, really. And, yeah. And, you know, the drawings themselves are almost like architectural plans. They're from every angle you can think of. So what we did was build the horse from those drawings in digital software. We have a haptic interface device so you can sculpt digital play, um, which is awesome. You should use one if you haven't before. But then we thought, what well, let's challenge some children to build a horse in virtual reality. They were sculpting in virtuality as well. It was amazing. But, I, but I'm, I'm also interested, we've done a couple of projects like this where we've took lost art basically and recreated it digitally. And yet you have that copy. And maybe fast forward with Da Vinci has got a digital copy yeah. now. And he'd have that for heaven. So now we can sell, now we can reproduce this in lots of different types of materials. But, but also it's about a case of ownership in a kind of way. It is, who owns Da Vinci? Does Mark own it now because he's <laughs> modelled it? But there's a lot of questions around that as well. That's a great phrase, I'm going to use that. Don't mention the horse. So there are other projects as with many people who were polymaths, that he abandoned along the way. And, uh, and one of those is his anatomical treaties. Would you like to explain yes, about that? Yes, yeah. I mean, um, what happened with these uh, anatomical treaties is, as I um, mentioned earlier on, he teamed up with this um, doctor and certainly took part in um, and dissected uh, at least 20 bodies um, with um, Marco Antonio della Torre. Um, particularly over this winter period of 1510, 1511. Of course, winter was crucial because um, dead bodies don't go off as quickly in the winter <laughs> as they yeah. do uh, in the summer. Um, uh, and then, uh, unfortunately for Leonardo, um, Marco Antonio della Torre, later on in 1511, um, dies of the plague. Um, so he loses his <laughs> university <laughs> collaborator and therefore loses his ability to use the university um, uh, to actually access um, cadavers um, and dead bodies. Um, and so he sort of abandons the treaties at that point. Um, and although he does try to do um, some further autopsies and dissections when he moves later on to Rome, but there he comes up against the Catholic Church, because of course Rome is the centre um, with the papacy, um, uh, and, um, and it was uh, um, uh, the Pope's brother who was one of his uh, main patrons in uh, Rome. Um, and so he literally comes up against that, and then there was also some other um, person who was causing problems for him, and, and, uh, so he wasn't able to, to perform any autopsies um, in, uh, in Rome. Um, so by, I think by then, by the time he moves right at the end of his career to uh, the court in France, um, uh, which didn't have a sort of university attached or anything like that, um, he, uh, I think he's more or less abandoned the whole idea of, um, of producing his treatise, despite the fact that he you know, produced loads and loads of drawings or whatever. And in the end, in fact, um, Leonardo's anatomical drawings were not published uh, until the end of the 19th century. Um, so they were just... Uh, uh, that theme of failure is, is prolonging, clearly, but it's the 19th century, no one sees these drawings, but I think it's worth noting the horse was, was it 20 plus years before 
he's had an article or treatises was kind of being yes. gathered. Yeah. So his style of refining, so he's moving from metal point through to chalk and then inks as well with the chalks yeah. and then anatomical sheets. Um, he was refining his methods, but actually never finishing anything was a reoccurring lifelong theme, I guess. Yes. Yeah. And, and part of it, why he doesn't, are other projects that he doesn't finish, is partly because he was an inveterate experimenter of yeah. techniques. Yeah. And like artists who do that, you know, if you're experimenting with techniques, you're going to fail at some point or other, yeah. um, because you know you're you're pushing you're pushing the boundaries. And but I know for Lowell, Lowell loves the failure. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where the lessons are learnt as well, and I think that's that's in part that's all part of the journey of making and actually invention. And I, 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 when I even when we were doing, like sort of doing this sort of like model. We were also actually getting quite sort of excited that it did fail. Because yeah. then we were looking at, well, if, if Da Vinci revisits and comes back, then he, he would have finished yeah. it. And if they come into a fab lab now, it, you know, they'd be, we'd be building drones. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. Mm. Yes. You know. yes, he definitely, I'm sure he'd love drones. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's our next project. And the, the fab lab is. Forgive me, I'm not meaning to be insulting, but it's like a celebration of failure, isn't it? Because all of the things that are made in there that work are taken away. And the yeah. things that are left that are around the rooms on the shelves are all the failures that are then there for everyone to I like, see. I like how to celebrate that when I show them off to people. This is our failures. And I've had some, yeah, so yeah, so quite interesting, actually, yeah. So the other question was in relation to his... So Vasari, his description of Leonardo da Vinci is that he didn't want to uh, draw anything or make anything that couldn't be scientifically proven. And obviously there was a, yes, a clash of that in yeah. relation to the Bible and his heresy. So you just expand yes. on that yeah, a little. That, that actual comment that is actually Leonardo's. Le Leonardo, yeah. um, uh, in one of his notes or letters, I can't quite remember which, um, said that he... Didn't he refused to either write about or draw events that quotes cannot be proved by an instance of nature, um, and that anything to do with religion he left to the clerics. That was their their realm. Yeah. He he was going to concentrate on um, what can be proved by an instance of, of nature. Um, and in the uh, first edition of uh, Giorgio Vasari um, writes um, the biography of Leonardo in, in, um, in his Lives of the Artists. Um, and in the first edition in 1550, he actually comments that uh, Leonardo had nearly near heretical views um, on Bible events. And, and it is true that, for example, because, for example, he uh, because of his um, studies of geology, um, Leonardo didn't believe in the biblical tale of the flood because he realised that um, they couldn't possibly um, have happened in the way that the Bible um, said. Um, um, and so you find that, in fact, the final drawing in the exhibition, which is drawn right at the end of uh, uh, Leonardo's career, which... Uh, I refer to it as a sort of a storyboard of little minuscule apocalyptic deluge scenes uh, of different, you know, ev events of, um, sort of cataclysmic storms and uh, uh, and so on. Um, there, the note um, that accompanies the, these uh, frenzied drawings um, is actually quite a dispassionate note. Uh, and commentary about what clouds look like um, in the shadow and uh, what clouds look like against a, 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 a silhouetted against the sun and what trees look like uh, in the shadow, which is sort of quite at odds with the frenzied drawing. Um, so, so you've got that sort of contrast. But at the same time, those, those notes and the whole idea of doing deluge scenes... Um, probably emerged from Leonardo's, another of Leonardo's treatises, which was simply a treatise that he started writing many, many decades earlier um, for painters, and it was called On Painting. And this was simply 
um, telling painters um, how to show weather, you know, weather um, formations and cloud formations uh, uh, and so on. And yet he then takes that sort of analytical, observational notes and turns it into these sort of frenzied scenes of, uh, you know, water and overwhelming mountainside towns and um, flames from the sky incinerating people. So it's a sort of spur of using scientific observation to spur into a very imaginative, um, doom-laden scene. Now, to any other artist and any viewer of a deluge in the 16th century, they would have immediately thought about the biblical narrative of Noah and the flood. And yet there's no evidence. He, he, Leonardo uses the, the, the sort of storyboard um, drawing to help him produce a series. He does a, a large series of um, about 11 drawings in black chalk, which are quite large drawings, which are simply of deluge. There's simply a water um, um, sort of pouring out of the sky and over um, towns and uh, landscapes. Um, nowhere in any of those drawings, there are about seven of these drawings in the Royal Collection, and they're on display uh, around the country uh, at different venues. Nowhere in those deluges is there any indication that Leonardo, for a minute, was doing a biblical Noah scene. He was doing it purely out of, yes, for himself. Yeah. Um, right. So, you know, that, that's sort of the element. And, the, and in, in a way, that is a direct contrast to um, his uh, um, uh, contemporary, or younger, much younger contemporary, younger uh, next generation, Michelangelo, yeah. who was, uh, in contrast to Leonardo, um, was actually a very devout. Um, yeah. And I've got a quote sorry, from, go. from Martin Kemp, the scholar, which kind of speaks to this, and it's talking about Leonardo's precise matching of visual experience and painted representation that notes three-dimensional forms on a 2D surface. That's what he was doing. He was yes. just drawing what he was observing. So that leads me on to my question, really, was that do you, do you think that we ever get to see into his imagination? Because everything he did was so precise and so observational apart from those deluge and fire descriptions that you're talking about, do you think that he ever just worked from his imagination? I, uh, yes, I mean, yes, because I think, I think those deluge ones yeah. are pre precisely showing that. Because he wasn't watching yes. a, um, yes, that yes, scene. Yes, yeah. 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 I think some of his studies of her as well, which are very similar to yes. the deluges, are almost linking the two, yes. maybe not purposefully, mm. but at least in the way he was drawing them, they're very similar. Yes, yeah. Well, he was fascinated by water. I mean, one of the uh, uh, elements, I think, in, in Leonardo is that he does see, he believes in the sort of underlying pattern of nature that underlies everything. Um, and so that's why in one, one of the other drawings, he, again, has, um, you know, he's concentrating on the flow of water uh, around a plank that's been put into a water, a stream of water. Um, and yet he makes those, the, the, the water becomes like threads. Um, and then the note beside it references the relationship between water and, and what it looks like and the hair and the way that hair curls and waves. Um, uh, um, uh, and so he's constantly making these sort of cross references. And to some extent, he is actually stylizing the way that the water is flowing in that drawing to make it look even more like braided hair than I think it ever mm. did, you know. So there's, yeah. a, there's an element of... Of both, yes. yeah. And so for me, many of his drawings are some of the most representative of 3D shape. You can, you can see very clearly that he had 3D in his head when he was making 2D marks. He very clearly sees that. So, Lola, I was going to ask you, in terms of translating his 2D into 3D, yeah. how does that compare to other um, illustrations that you've worked on from students or from, from artists? And, and 
is it easier for you to work from his sketches to make 3D? That's quite interesting because one of the projects we did last year where to celebrate the 20 years of the Coast anniversary was we had a flat image. Uh, one of our interns, Alex, who was this amazing fine artist, was, was moving into the digital world, the 3D digital world. And then she, and I thought it was interesting about uh, Leonardo as well, about was he a dreamer? You know, did he imagine? Yes. I think it's important. Yeah. I always have a reference back to John Lennon at some point. Um, but, yeah, so, so to reimagine that and then turn that into 3D digitally, was that, I was really interested in that process because basically we, something that didn't exist now exists. And looking at those sketches today, we're really interested in how we, it was really easy and, and not just from, from Mark's eye or my, or my eye, it was, it, was, it, was the, it was the sort of young people. They were amazing. They, they were amazing. Anywhere. They were looking at these sketches and just like transform it, you know, whether that's through the source, through virtual reality, which was totally, blew me apart really, because there was that's in that immersive environment which still existed. And I was also interested that, you know, how would Leonardo be in, in an immersed environment, a different world almost. But then, yeah, so it was just, just that sort of process and that, flow, I call it the flow, that how you turn those sketches into 3D was, was I'd always like to read simple, but it kind of was, uh, and it was just that sort of interpretation that I'm through, I say, even not through Da Vinci's eyes, but through everyone's eyes, that, that was the point of today, really, now the workshops really worked for us, and, that, and the fact that these tools, these digital technology tools, actually worked. And that's, I think, going forward, you know, why would Leonardo use these, you know, how would he interact with a, with a fab lab, actually? Mm -hmm. It would just take it to another level. In yeah. That sense. yeah. I, mean, I mean, credit to him as well. His kind of multi level, almost like architectural plans of yeah. the body, specifically and the other things, you know, offer different viewpoints that maybe we don't see from just one dimensional 2D drawings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was to, to go and draw a horse, I'd probably sit in front of a horse and draw it from one view. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would potentially think to walk around the other side, <laughs> and, <laughs> the other side and see if it's different. Um, but maybe I wouldn't. Mm. And I think that he was so meticulous in his documentary allows us really to harness He wasn't that. drawing a horse, he was understanding he a understanding horse. Understanding a horse, yeah. Exactly, yeah. 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 So I'm going to throw it open to questions from the floor in a moment, but I know that, Xanthi, you had a quote that you wanted to share with us. Uh, yeah. This is actually a quote from uh, a present day artist, um, Stephen Farthing, um, who is a royal ac academician. Um, and his brother is actually a medic. Um, and they've recently produced a book about Leonardo's anatomical um, uh, drawings. And uh, Stephen Farthing was recently interviewed, um, and he was, he was criticising uh, what he called um, the popular myth that um, too much knowledge messes with an artist's creativity. Mm. Now, that is actually um, a, a, a criticism that was actually made of Leonardo in a way that um, by sometimes by contemporaries of his but equal, even more so of late, much later art historians they sort of criticise Leonardo for you know going down the path of getting more and more knowledge and detailed knowledge of anatomy or yeah. whatever instead of actually um, producing creating um, uh, paintings um, and Stephen Farthing sort of reacts to this by saying that it actually takes a lifetime of joining fragments of information to produce a bigger picture. And if you want to produce a bigger picture, you, um, you need to know a lot. You hmm. need to know a lot of fragments in order to produce a bigger picture, because otherwise you simply will fail to produce the bigger picture. Great, thank you. So I'm going to open it up to comments or questions. Yeah. Okay, this is, um, I remember there's a quote from the thing Rick and Farm and the space shuttle blew up. This is all that engineering is mad because of failure. Okay. So I, I, so I did an engineering drawing A level. Yeah. I did engineering design at the end of that level. Okay. But I'm just thinking about education, engineering education now. Okay. And I went through those courses that were very prescriptive, prescriptive. So you learn the top sections. Yeah. You learn how to draw gears, you learn how to draw an engine, you learn all projection angles and yeah. stuff like this. It was quite planned out, I think, 
do you think there'll be a better way of, of learning to do engineering to go back to observe, start off from observing nature, to play with nature and analysing nature so that the, the, so the, you will learn to accept your failure as an engineer because you end up in this, I think part of the reason this split, maybe, maybe it's just this country we have this split between techies and arty parties. Because <laughs> the arty parties are allowed to fail because yeah. of the arty parties. Yeah. The techies have to get your printer working. Okay. <laughs> and I think maybe, maybe there needs to be a change in our, in our culture where engineers are allowed to fail and, are, and we accept our hoovers are going to stop working because we're going to end up with a hoover. I can't totally agree. Um, the Fab Lab space in the Island Design School is basically designed to do that. So we, we have engineers, uh, fine artists, architects who come in and bump into each other. And although can I, I, I say play, and I could, you could call it research, but that experimentation where you break that down and... Can I just interject? Yeah. Because I'm just wondering, does that feed back to pre-degree level? Where schools now who are teaching people O level and you know, drawing are letting people just play. I, mean, I, I, I went to Polytechnic to do engineering. Yes. We had a thing with engineering applications. We went to go to a metal workshop yeah. and make things to learn that we weren't going to design things that were impossible to make. I think, I think and those restrictions on tolerance are now disappearing with yeah. added technologies. So yes. did I, I would believe that wholly. And okay, I'm speaking at the other end of this scale at postgraduate level. And so my students are in the room right now and we teach them a lot about just process. Yeah. It's that level of experimentation and don't be afraid to fail but then document and reflect upon your process to move yeah. forward, which might end up helping you build a better Hoover <laughs> um, in doing so. Um, but I think educationally it's, it's not a very widespread <coughs> moment that kind of way of working is deemed uh, wholly acceptable. I think we've, we've built an education system, haven't we, where people are taught to how to pass and how to succeed. And, and what that creates are people who are afraid to experiment because they don't ever want to fail. So, and the only way to get around that is to assess people in their level of experiment. And I think that's what art schools are doing more and more of now. Part of the marks and the assessment that students are getting is about their level of experimentation, regardless of whether they fail in their, in their target or not. Your thing's not working, well, that's fine, because at least there's an idea. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I did learn from some of the kids today in the schools that they were like, oh, I've got that 3D printer in school. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we use this 3D scanner in school. And that's great to hear, that they're having that, that play, that accessible um, technology to allow them to just make, fail, and so on. Yes. Uh, uh, First of all, I just want to thank uh, the members of the panel and the chair for a really interesting place uh, after the run over with us. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, apart from the panel, the only reason I would come to an ex exhibition like this is to see wonderful drawings, absolutely wonderful drawings. And it's amazing to see them you know, as extracts from the sketchbook. And the value of sketchbooks is still very important in the schools of arts and design, but perhaps not as important as, as it could be. So I think we need to learn from the value of, of the sketchbook as a record. I'm very interested in the process of dissection, uh, the way that the Leonardo kind of separate the body of the horse, uh, the body of people, as a discipline to resolve and sort out kind of uh, issues. And so the process of dissection might be close to deconstruction. We are now in the 21st century, and uh, you know, it was a past, now it's the Renaissance. There was something in between, I don't know what that was, and now we're in the 21st century. Uh, my question really is to do with, uh, I've just looked on my iPhone about the design of this, uh, flying machines with birds' wings. Now, Caroline used the word imagination. Mm. That, for me, was an incredible piece of imagination to be designing a flying machine in the Renaissance. I just wondered what was he high on. What was he doing? And this is from the whole uh, Did it fly? Is it evidence that, I don't think it does fly, 
there's a charm to the fabula. They were flying this year. We've got drones. Was it a drone? Was it a helicopter? Yeah. Amazing kind of technology there that I think the fabula should be exploring. And you should be flying those machines <laughs> around the school of art and design. Um, I think that, that okay. and I'm also quite interested in showing that up about you know, sort of pro, you know, project driven sort of skills as well, you know, learning those skills that will enable us to build the flying machine. And I think, I think we just sort of, and also we, we sort of revisit, revisiting Leonardo and looking at some of the sort of ideas, because part of what we're trying to do is turn ideas into reality as well. And that's part of this process. So, yeah, I think we're going to revisit and sort of review and recycle and then use this newer technology to sort of, which, which can of what we saw today, it does help us move on and it does help us, you know, realise some of those ideas that maybe... I mean, those drawings are going to only exist, correct if I'm wrong, because he was interested in studying bird motion, flight... But, you know. Bird motion um, was uh, the origins, but also dragonflies. Um, he, there's, a, there's a comment of him watching dragonflies um, hovering over the, the moat um, around the, uh, the castle in the fortification in Milan. Um, so he, you know, and, and to be able to observe, I mean, observing wing, birds' wings in flight is, um, you know, sort of uh, amazing enough, but to actually study um, dragonflies and to use you know, the evidence from dragonflies to presumably stimulate his later thoughts about um, flying machines or whatever. I think some of, the, some of those sort of flying machines um, and ideas were partly actually stimulated um, by um, his activities as some, something uh, that people don't really realise that he uh, worked on both in Milan but also at the end of his career in Florence. Um, both of them had courts, um, royal courts, or uh, uh, <coughs> uh, military courts, um, and they were they loved having parties uh, mm -hmm. and royal um, festivities, and um, you know a festivity or a mask or a mask parade or whatever, uh, an event, um, you know, to celebrate the latest birth, royal birth, or or marriage or coming of age or whatever and uh, certainly there's a lot of evidence that Leonardo absolutely loved producing um, party tricks um, <laughs> things you know like um, sort of hot air balloons made out made to look like animals that sort of floated in the air and then burst in clouds of confetti and uh, and so on, on over the... So wondrous things, like yes. you said, you could see wondrous things here. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, I, I think some of those, you know, amazing machines that, that we now are, you know, are amazed that he even contemplated trying to design, I think they actually may have been spurred by, um, you know, uh, being an events organiser for a <laughs> royal court. <you> know. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Great. I think yeah. that I'm sorry. I don't think we've got much time because. I'm awful sorry because it's late and we have to really stick to our so seven o'clock deadline. Yeah. So sorry about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but if, um, if you do have questions, we have an email address that yeah. you could email to, and we could send it out as well. It's simply just Liverpool Laser at ljmu.ac.uk or just tweet us at hashtag Liverpool Laser. <laughs> Yeah, hashtag Liverpool laser, hashtag laser talks. Thank you very much.